I'm Libby Schaff, mayor of Oakland, California. I'm the mayor of Stockholm, capital of Sweden. Mayor of Minnesota's capital city, St. Paul. I'm the proud mayor of the great city of Chicago. Mayor of San Pedro, part of Monterrey, Mexico. I'm the mayor of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Birmingham, Alabama. Dayton, Ohio. I'm the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm the mayor of Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone. I come to City Lab for Reykjavik's future. My name is Jan Vapavori. I'm the mayor of Helsinki. Of Durham, North Carolina. The Bull City. Tacoma, Washington. Mayor Patterson. Greater Manchester in the UK. I'm the mayor of Huntington, West Virginia. Mayor of the city of Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm the mayor of San Francisco. I am the mayor of Topeka, Kansas. Mayor of New York's capital city. My name is Jose Luis Martinez Almeida, mayor of Madrid. Satellite in South Australia. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm the first diverse woman mayor in Bogota, Colombia. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Santiago de Chile. North New Jersey. I'm Stephen Reed, mayor of Montgomery, Alabama. Daniel Quintero. I'm the mayor of Medellin, Colombia. Mayors are important leaders, leaders right, right now, now. Right, right now. Because mayors are uniquely positioned and trusted to bring people back together and help solve real problems. Because we are on the front lines of two pandemics, COVID-19 and systemic racism. It all starts on the local level and mayors are driving that work. The mayors from all political parties, they're focused in making life better for every citizen. Mayors are important leaders right now. Because our local communities need decisive leadership to support and advocate for them. And deal with the social implications of the pandemic. We need City Lab this year. We, we need, need City Lab this year. We need City Lab this year. Because the virus know no borders, so neither should we. Because just as we're telling our communities that we will get through this together, we must get together to share the ideas that are coming out of local communities, the innovators of democracy. There is no city who is able to fight all the challenges of today's world alone. We need City Lab this year more than ever. This is one of the most important spaces. To continue to share our experiences, our innovations, and our successes. The pandemic has given us a once in a lifetime opportunity, and we have one chance to get it right. It is time for real solutions for all of us. To make sure that we recover from this pandemic. To help us achieve more resilient cities. The issues facing this country, the global health pandemic, the economic crisis, social justice issues. What this moment will look like and what form it will take will be determined by the very insights and perspectives City Lab provides. We need City Lab this year. 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 And every year to get through these challenging times. Together, together, together. together. Hello, everyone, and a big thank you to those amazing mayors from around the world. To them and to all of you watching across our global audience, welcome to City Lab. I'm Mike Bloomberg, and Bloomberg Philanthropies is glad to present this summit together with our longtime partner, the Aspen Institute. This year, instead of enjoying the hospitality of just one host city, we'll travel the globe and meet four hosts on four continents and we'll hear from each of their mayors. You'll see them on your screen now. The mayors of San Francisco, Bogota, Freetown, and Helsinki. We asked these four mayors to host City Lab because they have extraordinary stories to tell, both about how they got through 2020 and how they'll lead in the future. We all know what's at stake right now. The world is still facing a deadly pandemic and the economic fallout and a reckoning around racial justice and a climate crisis all at once. City leaders know that they can't wait around for national governments to come up with the solutions, just the opposite. The most innovative ideas almost always start at the local level. Eventually, they reach the world stage, 
but only after city leaders share and spread them, and that's what CityLab is all about. The demand for creative city-based solutions is more urgent than ever, and so this summit is more important than ever. The fact is, city leaders can act the quickest to keep people safe, deliver critical services, and more. City leaders can scale up the best ideas together with their strongest allies, and city leaders are the ones that the public trusts most to be honest and straight with them. Over the next three days, we'll hear from experts who work at the cutting edge of city innovation, and we have the perfect person to help lead us through our program. New Yorkers know him well from his nightly news show, Inside City Hall. He's also a national political analyst for CNN, an award-winning columnist, and he teaches journalism at the City University of New York. He'll be a great guide on the world tour of cities, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. Our host for City Lab 2021, Errol Lewis. Mike Bloomberg, everybody. Thank you so much, Mike. Hello and bonjour and buenos dias. I'm Errol Lewis. It is an honor to be your host and MC for Bloomberg City Lab 2021. We are coming to you live from New York City. And as we heard from Mike, this year's edition of City Lab is going to take us all around the world. My job is to help guide you along. Before we really get started, I want to share some tips for your best viewing experience. First of all, closed caption is available for all viewers. If you'd like to do that, you hover over the bottom of this video and click CC and select Display Captions. Next up, you should know that City Lab is not just any old web meeting. We have designed City Lab 2021 to be as interactive and collaborative as ever, even on the small screen. So if you're joining us on the official City Lab platform, on the right side of your screen, you'll see the official City Lab chat. I will be continually reading your reactions and your comments, and we invite you to use the chat to communicate with me and everybody else in our global audience. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Let's take a look and see who is with us. I see Eileen from Minneapolis, welcome. Margo is here from Cincinnati. Marcin is here from Warsaw and Jan from the Czech Republic. Welcome to all of you. Uh, during our panel discussions, you're gonna see thought provoking poll questions pop up. That's gonna happen on the lower left side of your screen. It's not quite scientific polling, but we do want you to answer those questions. We'd like to know what you are thinking about the big issues that cities are tackling. You can use the chat to send us any of your own questions and I'll do my best to get them answered in real time if we possibly can. And so now, coming off of a difficult year and as you look to many challenges, City Lab is once again a place for city innovators to recharge and learn from one another and take things back home that can move your communities forward. We have got a lot of ground to cover, so we're gonna start with two of the global crises that every local leader is grappling with right now. First up, of course, is the response to the pandemic. How is the American federal government coordinating now with states and localities? To find out, we are fortunate to have Judy Woodruff, the anchor of PBS NewsHour. She'll be speaking with the new Biden administration's chief scientific advisor on the COVID response task force. His name is Dr. David Kessler. During their chat, you should send us your own questions for Dr. Kessler, and hopefully Judy can get to one or two. Ramping up vaccinations is how we get to turn the page and bring our economies back to life. And so after our update on the vaccination effort, we're going to talk about the exciting possibilities of new inclusive urban economies, featuring the voices of four powerful women leaders, including Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. That is coming up. But first, as Mike Bloomberg said at the top, at this city lab, we've got places to go and people to see. So buckle up, because in one moment, we'll be biking through Bogota. Before you catch your breath, we'll be dancing ballet in Helsinki, and you'll see a public canvas being painted in San Francisco. Let's start by hearing from Mayor Yvonne Aki Sawyer and traveling to this dynamic City Lab host city, Freetown, Sierra Leone. <laughs> City Lab, we glad you say una de free song. Kushe, kushe, cabo. In Freetown, the people are warm. They're fun loving and they're incredibly hospitable. We're blessed with the mountains behind us. 
Then the Atlantic Ocean, and the water is warm. Outbreaks, whether Ebola or COVID, have so much to do with people changing their behavior. You start with behavior change messaging, but you've got to give behavior change support. 35% of our population live in informal settlements. 47% of our residents did not have access to running water. When your message is wash your hands regularly, the question back to you is how? Very practically as a city, we were able to provide 160 rainwater harvesting systems. So the idea really was, here's the message, how can we help you to support that message? I can see a future for my city where it becomes normal and commonplace for people to have backyard gardens. To grow the basics, we already have a number of communities already doing urban farming. But what we wanted to do was to come alongside them, provide technical input, ensure that they had water, help with training, everything they needed to scale up. All around me, I see signs of improvement. I'm full of hope. We've made a difference in the lives of ordinary Fritonians, and I'm not saying it, they're saying it. I'm super grateful for the opportunity the cities have all over the world to make a difference at the local level. It's such a privilege and an honor to be able to serve in this capacity. It is so nice to catch a glimpse of the global uh, picture. I'm Judy Woodruff of the PBS NewsHour, and it's my honor to be here along with Dr. David Kessler, who, of course, as you just heard, has been named to be the scientific advisor for the vaccine rollout, the COVID uh, response uh, on the part of the Biden administration. Dr. Kessler, very good to see you uh, in this uh, conversation we're going to have for the next 12 minutes. You were asked by the Biden team uh, when the campaign was underway last year to advise them. And then once he was elected, you were asked to head up uh, this effort from the science uh, standpoint. Tell us where the vaccine distribution picture was when the president took office and where is it right now? So, you know, my hat's off to my colleagues um, at what we used to call Operation Warp Speed uh, for really uh, doing uh, just terrific science uh, with our colleagues at the NIH uh, and uh, at uh, a number uh, of uh, companies. Uh, and they focused on making sure that they had options. They invested uh, in six plus different vaccines. They didn't know which vaccines would turn out to work. So they bought 100 million of this, 100 million of that, 100 million of that. They invested in 300 million of AstraZeneca. But as it turned out, as, as we all now know, Pfizer and Moderna uh, came in with really extraordinary uh, results at 94, 95% uh, percent, uh, efficacy. Um, and so when we came in, right, I mean, there, were not, there was not enough uh, vaccine. There was not enough supply. Um, to be able uh, to inject uh, all uh, adults over 18. So first uh, order of business, uh, first directive from the, the president uh, was to acquire uh, enough vaccine uh, for all adults. Uh, and as the president announced uh, two weeks ago, um, we had acquired uh, 600 million doses of Moderna and Pfizer um, to have enough vaccine uh, to immunize everyone by July 31st. So that was the first order of business. Second uh, issue right. was uh, while there was a plan to be able to ship these vaccines to the states, there was no plan to get these in arms. Um, so we had to stand up. So obviously, uh, with the good work of all states and, and local authorities, we had uh, to be able to assist and bring all the federal resources to help in that effort. 
And as you know, as all of us know, there have been some places have gotten the vaccine. What is it? Tens of millions of Americans do have the vaccine, but there's still many millions, hundreds of millions who don't have the vaccine yet. How are you? I mean, this is a program about the cities. How is the administration coordinating with states and cities, uh, jurisdictions to to make sure that the vaccine is getting to the places it needs to be as fast as possible. So, you know, we are working, I can tell you, uh, day uh, and night uh, with our state and local uh, health colleagues. I mean, if you look at where we were back in January, we were shipping about maybe five uh, to seven million uh, doses a week. Um, that has doubled. Uh, by uh, end of February, uh, and uh, certainly uh, that will triple uh, by early April. Um, so we have, we've had a supply uh, issue. Um, I think over time, over the next uh, few months, that will shift. We will open up uh, that uh, supply. But when you look at just the numbers, 96 million doses distributed, 75 million uh, administered to date, number of people receiving one or more doses, uh, 50 million, number of people receiving two doses, 25 million. And, and that's just in a few weeks of us being. And how can the federal government, you and I have talked about this, actually, Dr. Kessler, how much influence does the federal government have over local and state jurisdictions when it comes to making sure that the vaccine is distributed equitably. Yeah. I don't think the, the right word is influence. I think there's a real partnership uh, and working uh, together. Um, the, the state and local uh, authorities um, are administering uh, vaccines um, uh, in a number of different uh, settings. Uh, and we've added with the state and local authorities a number of settings to assure that the vaccine is uh, administered uh, equitably uh, and equally. We've added mass vaccination sites. We've stood up these smaller, some close to 500 smaller vaccination sites. We're uh, also making sure it's distributed now uh, in pharmacies, uh, in community health centers, uh, in mobile, uh, mobile centers. Uh, so we are adding a number of different distribution channels with our state and local partners to make sure that the vaccine gets to all Americans. How much of a challenge is there, and again, it's something I know very much on your mind, the mind of the administration, to make sure that underserved populations uh, who might have difficulty either with the online appointments or for some other reason may be reluctant to uh, participate, to, to take the vaccine. How is the administration working on these issues? You know, we, are, we stood up a number of distribution channels really focused. Um, you know, in a, in a central way on making sure that uh, those who are most vulnerable, um, that their communities have uh, access. Um, we have to recognize this is, I mean, with the limited supply to date, this is a problem of access, but we also have to deal with the question, the rightful question of hesitancy uh, and make sure that people, uh, all people uh, can trust the safety of the vaccine. And I've spent a lot of time, Judy, as you know, I ran FDA, uh, drug safety, vaccine safety is something I've studied for 30 or 40 years. And it's really, I mean, it's just extraordinary, one, to have three vaccines um, that have gotten authorization. And also, I mean, knock wood, I mean, everything I know about the safety profile, and I look at it very, very, very closely, uh, these are you know, remarkably uh, safe vaccines. And I think the public needs to understand that, and especially communities that have been rightfully distrustful uh, of the medical establishment uh, and government. I think they have to have confidence uh, in this vaccine, and I think they can. A question uh, coming in, uh, Dr. Kessler, from the director of the Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation in Baltimore. His name is Dan Heimowitz. It, it actually plays off what you were just saying a moment ago. What advice do you have for cities for getting the most from their collaboration with federal and state governments for their vaccine rollouts, particularly with an eye toward ensuring that the vaccines reach the most vulnerable? 
Yeah. You know, Mayor Bloomberg and I were talking uh, a number of days ago, uh, and what he remarked, and I think he's, he's right on, was that, you know, while we have a supply problem today, I mean, you know, we will uh, soon see that change um, with more and more vaccines, that doubling, that tripling of the, the amount of vaccines we ship every week. I mean, I think we're going to end up uh, with adequate supply, but we're going to have to be able to make people comfortable that they're willing uh, to take this. We're going to go from a supply problem to a demand uh, problem. So that last mile right, of really focusing um, on uh, people's uh, trust and transparency. I think it's very important. You know, we're collecting a lot of data, and I think we need to share that data uh, with the, the, the public and certainly uh, our state and local uh, partners to be able to share uh, with us and, and the public who's actually getting vaccinated to make sure that uh, we can show that we're doing this uh, equally and uh, equitably. So being transparent uh, with the public, making sure we maintain their trust. I think that's key here. I want to broaden it out uh, here as our time draws to a close, Dr. Kessler, to, to ask you, a, frankly, an international question. As you know, uh, the, w, the World Health Organization, the WHO and others have said the rich countries are buying up uh, all the available vac vaccines, the poorer countries around the world and their populations are having to wait uh, to the back of the line. What responsibility does the United States have to make sure that the, the people who live in countries that are not the richest uh, have their fair share of vaccines in a timely way. We have a great deal of responsibility, uh, not only to the United States, but globally. It's something the president cares very much about. That's why he talked about the pledge of $4 billion to the Global Alliance for Vaccine. Um, but I think we need to think about it in a way that it's not us buying up vaccines. I mean, we have an enormous ability, especially in the United States, to make vaccines. You know, we are a biomedical powerhouse. Um, and what we need to think about is using our resources to be able um, to serve the world uh, and use those uh, resources, uh, that biomedical powerhouse to be able to make enough drug substance, uh, fill finish, so we can make uh, these vaccines as quickly pos uh, available as possible around that world. We have enormous capability. Uh, no doubt, you know, the, that great biomedical capability put us in a very enviable position of now having three vaccines that have had EUA uh, authorization. But also with that, uh, comes a great deal of responsibility now to take all that knowledge and make it available to the world. And a very quick final question. How long do you think it'll be before everyone in the world who wants to be vaccinated can be vaccinated? You know, that's a, that's a hard uh, question, but I think we can, through the end of this year and into next year, I think we can have orders of magnitude uh, uh, of vaccine certainly in the billions of doses uh, available. Um, it is a very tall order, um, but I think we can get there uh, to make uh, this, you know, very important uh, uh, medicine, this, these vaccines available. Dr. David Kessler, uh, who of course, former FDA commissioner, now the science advisor for the Biden administration vaccine rollout. Dr. Kessler, thank you so much. My pleasure. And now, uh, absolutely. And now our next urgent conversation on city economies and rebuilding from COVID-19. Here is Lourdes German. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be joined today by an incredible roster of women to talk about this topic. I'm pleased to introduce Mary Daly, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Mayor of Chicago, and Ai Jin Pu, Executive Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, to really talk about what's possible as we consider this new economy. And ladies, I'm going to begin with one question posed to all three of you. Now that we're seeing what we're grappling with in the wake of COVID-19, 
and so many issues that are rising to the top. What do you think may be possible coming out of this crisis that wasn't possible before from a U.S. perspective? Pleasure to be here with all of you. Look, I, I think one of the big headlines coming out of the pandemic is that the things that we thought were impossible before are actually possible and really absolutely necessary. And let me drill down a little bit more on that. When we think about economic recovery, we have to be thinking about it in the context of a broader ecosystem. And one thing that the pandemic has definitely laid bare is a lot of underlying economic fault lines all <clears throat> around race, around class, gender, um, and inequalities that people believe were intractable, too big to actually solve. But I think the lesson for me, at least in the city of Chicago, is we ignore those fault lines at our peril. We see that many of our communities are extraordinarily exposed and vulnerable due to historic uh, inequities that just can't be ignored one second longer. Whether it's around uh, working class, whether it's um, uh, workforce development, whether it's um, wages and salaries and work conditions um, and healthcare and access to it, and the, really the list is long, all of these things interconnect and really um, are gonna dictate whether or not we fully recover in all of our neighborhoods with all of our people and particularly those who have been hardest hit by the pandemic. So I really think this gives us a tremendous opportunity to right some historic wrongs because our future truly depends upon a very expansive and inclusive economic recovery. Great. And I know President Daly would love to hear your thoughts as well, because I know you've, you've certainly remarked that we're seeing a tale of two pandemics. We are seeing a tale of two pandemics. And I really like what Mayor Lightfoot just said. I think that one of the things we, we noticed in this pandemic is it magnified and of course amplified so many of the fault lines that she referenced. I think that was exactly right. And what it does is it it's so big, we can't look away. It really helped us learn that these are not things we blame people for. These are things for no fault of their own, they find themselves in. And my hope is that this tale of two pandemics has opened our eyes and we will commit to continue to look and we'll make everything possible because we won't think of people as, well, they're not good enough. So that's why they find themselves in that situation. And I think what's possible now is that we'll align and we'll recognize that our duty as people is to deliver the next generation a better future than the one we inherited. And we certainly can't give them a worse one. So I really like what Mayor Lightfoot said. I think this interconnectivity, seeing the fault lines and capitalizing on that vision so that we can make this move forward. I think everything's possible. Great. And I think I'd love to hear your perspective as well as you represent a group of care workers that are deemed essential. Well, I would just build off of that by saying that I am I am incredibly hopeful as well um, because I do think that the fault lines that Mayor Lightfoot named, the deeply embedded inequities that have shaped our economy and really defined it, are were so deeply embedded that we needed a big disruption in order to really shake loose what is possible. And this pandemic has disrupted everything about the way that we live, work, care in this country, and it creates this opening for us to actually address the things that have now been revealed to so many of us. And many of the things that have been revealed are things that workers at the bottom of our economy have seen and always known, right? So we're able, um, when we used to go to the movies and we used to be able to see 3D movies, we would put on those glasses and all of a sudden things would become in full relief, right? Multi-dimensional. At the bottom of the economy, what workers were seeing was a complete lack of access to a safety net, um, working incredibly hard and still not able to make ends meet, even though they knew that their work was essential, right? Now we all see that some of the work that was least visible to us is actually essential to our safety, our health, and our well being. And it's often done by women and workers of color. And now that we see this, we can't unsee it and we have the disruption we needed to chart a new status quo, a new way forward. So I do feel really hopeful that this is our time to reset the economy for the 21st century. 
Great. And as you mentioned workers, I know another essential group of workers are teachers. And we've seen so much happening under the pandemic with education. Um, Mayor Lightfoot, I'd love for you to comment on this question. We've seen the role that teachers and schools play not only in educating children, but in the functioning of local economies and participating in the local workforce. Any lessons about the future of unionized labor, particularly with respect to teachers? Well, look, I think this, this pandemic has been <clears throat> especially hard on all workers unionized or not, um, there are whole industries that have just shut down as a result of uh, pandemic uh, enforced closures. And workers are human, right? They, they feel in the same things that we all do. And there's a tremendous amount of fear and trepidation and trauma that is um, a, at the core of a lot of concerns about workplace safety. And that was certainly uh, a through line in our recent discussions with our teachers union, but it's not unique uh, to teachers. I think it's something that all workers are feeling some concern about and employers really have to grapple with that, not just municipal employers, but I think all employers, <clears throat> people are still scared. They're still fearful about their health, the health and well-being of people in their household and whether or not um, they have the luxury of teleworking um, or have to come and be on the front lines every single day, those fears are still very much present. And so I think we have to deal with that reality as employers and as a mayor, I have to deal with that as a reality um, for residents in my city and making sure that workplace conditions, whether it's at City Hall or in some private sector a company, um, meet the needs and the challenges of this moment making sure that workers understand what their rights are, um, that their concerns are amply um, amplified, I will say, and that the employers are being responsive to make sure that they're creating a workplace environment where they can be heard, um, but also where they can be safe. You. And as we've all talked, um, I keep hearing today themes that align to our K-shaped recovery that the U.S. is experiencing, where we have a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots. Um, I'll start with President Daly. As you think about this, do you agree that this is what we're seeing? And if this is where we're headed, what policies and practices have the best possibility of reversing this trend from your perspective? Sure. Well, the, the pandemic, as we know, really affected some sectors more than other sectors. So as Mayor Lightfoot just referenced, if you have the luxury of teleworking, then you actually are doing pretty well. But that's conditional on what industry you work in. If you're teleworking in the airlines industry, you're not in very good shape. So it really has been a tale of two pandemics in the sense that those who didn't have the luxury of benefiting from some of the, the things that happened in the disruptions, they've been left behind. And those who had the luxury have been growing you know, pretty rapidly. As a consequence, we have deepening divides that were already present, as many have mentioned. That is where we have to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. It's, it's more than just recognizing that we had this embedded systemic inequality that was here. It's actually gotten much worse. And so an inclusive recovery, one that we can be proud of, would be one where everybody has a place where we go back and get all of those workers who were displaced, we bring them back into the labor market, and we rethink what back in the labor market looks like. You know, I just heard uh, Mayor Lightfoot talk about workers essentially having to fight for their rights. And what would be better, what policies we really need is to think that employers, workers, we want a work, work life not a balance, but a work-life integration. So people don't have to make trade-offs between schooling their children, taking care of their families, or working. I mean, I really want a world where we don't have to eat at a local restaurant, get served by individuals, and then wonder if they made a trip to the food bank on the way home, which was already happening prior to the pandemic and is continuing to happen to a very large fraction of our population during the pandemic. So a K-shaped recovery is not acceptable. That's the bottom line. We need a recovery that includes everyone and in fact has most rapid recovery for those at the very bottom who have been bearing most of the weight of the pandemic. Great. And on that front, Aijan, I'd love for you to comment on some of the specific policy changes that you've helped pass over these years that speak to these issues, particularly for those workers right at the bottom. Absolutely. Um, well, I want to actually lift up an initiative that we've partnered with Mayor Lightfoot on, um, which is a really powerful model of how we can work together as organizations, advocates, city governments, and in the private sector to lift up 
uh, workers who are at the bottom of the economy, like domestic workers. Um, the initiative is called My Home is Someone's Workplace, and it really does what Mayor Lightfoot named, which is educate uh, employers about and workers about their rights and really encouraging people to have the conversation about what it looks like to work safely and do it in a way that recognizes the rights that workers at the bottom of the economy have. We've worked also with the city of Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia passed a domestic workers bill of rights that mandated a portable paid time off for the six, city's 16,000 domestic workers which is really exciting, the first of its kind in the country. We've also worked with the city of Seattle to pass a domestic worker bill of rights that established a standards board that brought together employers, workers, and the city to sit at the table together to talk about what fairness looks like for domestic workers in the city and to move forward on solutions from there. And I really do think that that multi-stakeholder approach where we're drawing on the assets in the community, the incredible courage and resilience of workers and their perspectives, employers and their perspectives, and the power of city government together to talk about what it looks like to have fairness in the workplace. That kind of model, I think, is really essential and, and has made a huge difference in terms of workers understanding they have rights, they have a voice, and that they have value and can have, can have dignity at work. Um, regardless of where they work, what their employment status is, how they work, what the relationship or the um, designation is, right? Everyone has to be a part of the recovery in this moment. And this is a way to send a message to workers who've been left behind that they are essential. Great. Thank you. And on that note, what a wonderful and powerful example. Mayor Lightfoot, I'd love for you to comment on just the role that cities can play in creating more inclusive economies and driving forward policies like the ones that you're already at the center of in Chicago. Fundamentally, for me, the best public policy is one that reflects the realities and the lived experience of people in our cities, particularly people who feel like they're never seen, never heard, by the powerful, by government, don't have a seat at the table. When we go out and extend ourselves with a humble heart and a listening ear, and then bring the power of these testimonies and stories into public policy and do things to protect and uplift them, to me, that is the most noble part about public service. And we've been able to do that even in the midst of the pandemic in a lot of different circumstances. And as I've said to my team, we have to build not temporary scaffolding around a problem, but a foundation on which we can build for the future. And we've been doing that in a lot of different ways, particularly around healthcare disparities. But when you, when you deal with healthcare disparities, you're dealing with the economy and the economic realities of people's lives. And that has, I think, an important residual benefit. Great. And in our last two minutes, ladies, we're all doing this panel. And here we sit with a new urban economy where women have been particularly hard hit. What, if you can offer in 30 seconds, a closing thought is needed in order to reimagine the full participation of women as we look towards an economy that hopefully is better in 2021 and beyond? Well, could I start because I want to do something about this particularly. iGen has talked about essential workers. Mayor Life was talking about essential workers. We have to think of essential workers as not disposable. We often treat them as essential and we see them as essential, but then we treat them as disposable right around the corner. And I think we have to break that, that cycle. The second thing we have to realize is parenting is also essential work. And if we put those two concepts together, I feel like we'll welcome women back into the labor force. We'll want them to participate and we'll want them to also take care of their families and not be in this awkward trade-off that we mentioned earlier between you know, feeding families and taking care of families. That's really what's gonna welcome women back and it's what's gonna get us back to our full potential. I'll just build off of that and say that I think we should think about caregiving and the work that goes into caring for our families as essential infrastructure that we have to invest in. Child care, paid leave, an expanded safety net, elder care, like home and community-based services in particular for the aging population and people with disabilities. This is essential infrastructure that makes all 
possible. And if we invest in it in the way that we do bridges, tunnels, and broadband, I think that we can actually transform this economy for women. So I'll, I'll uh, pick up on all of these themes and, and, and phrase it in the context of a, a, a round hole square peg paradigm. By that, I mean this. I, I am a woman that's worked in corporate America for most of my uh, professional career. And what we do is we open up the doors uh, to institutions for women. But what we haven't done is thought about well, what are those basic premises of these institutions? They are built by and for men. So welcoming women into an institution that is built by and for men ignores the realities of who we are, what role we play in the families. So I think this, when we think about welcoming women back to the workforce, we've got to think about, well, what does that workforce actually fundamentally look like? And are we building structures that reflect the realities of women's role often as not only a breadwinner, but also the primary caretaker of our children? And if we think about it that way, we're going to build better, more responsive institutions that actually do welcome women and provide them with the kind of supports that are necessary to be fully engaged in the range of responsibilities that we always have. Great. Thank you. This has been a terrific conversation where I know so many bold solutions, partnerships, and ideas have been surfaced. I really appreciate all of your insights. And as we transition to the next part of the program, we all know an essential component of city economies is arts and culture. So let's go to one of our cities, Helsinki, to learn more. The Finnish National Opera and Ballet has been performing to limited audiences. And if the restrictions are tightened, we are still preparing and rehearsing our future premieres. We are working on the world premiere for Swan Lake. We wear masks and keep our distance. It means a lot to me to be in the studio. We are very lucky. We've been able to present our productions through free streamings. The house remains here by the sea, but our audiences are much further I think this crisis has really highlighted the need that people have to enrich their everyday lives. Wow, seeing the Finnish National Opera and Ballet in action, I can't wait to get back to Broadway and see some theater myself. So what are the creative institutions in your city doing? How are they reaching audiences and how are they keeping their virtual doors open? Please tell us in the chat. I've been reading a lot of great ideas and perspectives so far. There's a lot of energy. I love it. Uh, please keep it going. I saw Jane joining us from Nairobi, Allison in Saskatoon, um, Dina in Kazakhstan. Uh, it, it was a, it's amazing to see these ideas. And let me say too that we had a powerful discussion about the new urban economy each of those women leaders is doing amazing work. And as a quick plug, you can follow Mary Daly's work in our host city of San Francisco by listening to the new season of her podcast. It's called Zip Code Economies. In fact, it launches today. You can find the link in the chat. Coming up soon, we're gonna gaze into the City Lab crystal ball. The recent shocks to our cities have been profound and they're affecting all aspects of how we live and work and worship and play. So what does it all mean? How will our cities change because of COVID-19? To help us peek around the corner and look into the future, we have asked several leading voices to join us, including Ruben Abraham, Sir David Ajay, and Dr. Carlo Raddy. Leading that conversation will be the city's expert from the World Economic Forum, Alice Charles. First though, we're gonna take a deep dive into the climate issue and explore how two cutting edge cities are going carbon neutral. In a moment, you'll hear from Milan Mayor Giuseppe Sala, and we're going to start in one of our host cities. You're going to hear from Helsinki's Deputy Mayor for Urban Environment, Ani Sinemaki. Here to speak with her from University College London is Sir Jeff Mulgan. Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Deputy Mayor Sinemaki. We're going to talk mainly about climate change and what cities are doing uh, to cut carbon. But just before we do, perhaps you could say one word on what the mood is in Helsinki nearly a year into this, this crisis. How are people feeling? 
somewhat tired, I would say. Finland and Helsinki has not been the hardest hit countries or cities during the pandemic, but at the moment, uh, actually our rates are in increase and there will be more closings coming. So there's somewhat a tired situation or mood in the city. And I think uh, me, including many of us, are also following the vaccination rate quite keenly when since that is something that is positive that it goes up. So your city has long been right on the cutting edge of action on environmental issues, uh, clean energy, new kinds of buildings, uh, technology, the circular economy. Many people feared at the beginning of the crisis that it would set back action on climate change and some, that would become less of a priority. Well, what's been happening in Helsinki over the last year? In Helsinki, I'm happy to tell you that the consensus, the common understanding that we must be firm with our climate action uh, despite the pandemic or that actually the pandemic and its root causes just underline it, how important it is for cities to work for climate action and to broad, uh, to work towards broader environmental agenda. Uh, and which areas of action are delivering the most in terms of cutting carbon? You have quite ambitious targets on achieving net zero. What are the main measures which will get you there? Our target is to be carbon neutral by 2035. Um, and for us, it means that we need 80% emission reductions from the 1919 level till 2035. Uh, two fields where we are most um, working at the moment are the two most important fields um, in the city. Um, it's built environment, the energy efficiency of our buildings, and then it's also the energy production. We have during this council period past uh, more than three years, really set the bar high when it comes to new buildings being more energy efficient than the national requirements are. And also we have set uh, really ambitious targets uh, when renovating the older building stock. Uh, that the energy efficiency should improve. That is something that's not so visible, but when it's rolling, it actually gives you long-term benefits in fighting uh, climate change and in uh, reducing the emissions. And then energy production, it's a big question for us. And uh, we have been organizing a Helsinki Energy Challenge, uh, an international competition uh, to get us uh, rid of uh, coal that we are still using mm -hmm. and the results of this competition uh, will be announced late March so this is a really an exciting exciting time for us uh, regarding energy production and in terms of mobility and transport uh, what are you doing there presumably you're slightly constrained by climate in terms of getting people walking and cycling uh, but how much can shifting transport behavior contribute to your 2035 target? Transport, it's, uh, it's of course the third important uh, sector um, uh, with the uh, energy efficiency of the buildings and energy production. Um, we have been achieving um, targets or having um, uh, decreasing emissions from the from the uh, transport, but that is still something I think we have to work on to be faster, to be more systematic. Uh, good thing for Helsinki is that we are really a traditional uh, public transport city, and both walking and cycling uh, have been increasing lately. So uh, all together, walking, cycling and public transport, uh, they take, uh, they are almost 80% of all the journeys being made in Helsinki. And that gives us a benefit when uh, reducing the emissions. And then it's of course also electrifying the vehicles, be it buses or be it people's private cars. And how much do you think cities should be getting into the business of, behavior change. I mean, not just things like recycling and uh, and maybe you leaving the car at home, but things like giving up meat. Is that something where 
uh, should be part of city politics or, or is that inappropriate as a space for you? Um, we have sort of in Helsinki divided the action plan on climate in two blocks. So they are really um, sort of hard uh, measures where we can have straight influence, where we can really calculate, okay, if we do this, if we put this requirement, it reduces emissions this much. But we also want to um, have an influence in consumer-based uh, emissions and in the culture change. But that is, of course, um, it's more abstract. But we have actually a target that we will um, half the amount of dairy products and meat uh, in the meals that the city offers uh, from the year uh, 2018 till the uh, 2025. So I think we are contributing in the cultural change, but we do not want to do it completely like, okay, this is something we force upon you. But of course, it's um, still what people eat at school it's part of the culture change of course so uh, we feel we contribute there and in the um, recycling economy our our libraries they can lend you uh, sewing machines for example so you don't have to own your own we do such stuff uh, as well well, look, thank you. And you, you have a national government, as you say, very committed on this agenda, which isn't true of every uh, country. Uh, thank you so much, Deputy Mayor Sinemaki, for talking to us. And we will be watching in great interest as you walk the talk in terms of your targets on, on net zero. Thank you so much. And I also had a chance to speak to uh, Mayor Sala of Milan about their climate action plan. And we're going to turn to that conversation now. It's very good to be with um, you, Mayor Sala, uh, mayor of a great city, but also uh, leading the C40 task force on climate change. And in a moment, we will turn to what cities are doing to invest in cutting carbon. But before we do, perhaps you could just say a word on what the mood is in the city. A year, nearly a year after the crisis hit your region very hard, uh, the world saw Andrea Bocelli singing from the Duomo. I think that was March last year. So how does it feel right now? What is the mood? Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the situation is quite complicated because after one year, the people in Milan, our uh, people, uh, um, I mean, they, they don't know when uh, every, everything will be solved. We are waiting for vaccines, and even from this point of view, the news are not so, so clear. So it is not simple. Now, the situation is under control, but we are seeing a, a light peak in these days. And the public, the political debate uh, is sometimes uh, quite silly. Yeah. So turning to, to climate change, obviously cities like yours have in much of the world taken a leading role on taking climate change seriously. The C40 was set up nearly 20 years ago. Uh, and in the US in particular, cities had to perhaps lead when federal government was not interested. There was a lot of worry last year that the energy on climate change would reduce because of the pandemic. So are you seeing a slowing of strategies or actions or has it helped to amplify them or accelerate them? No, honestly, I'm not seeing um, uh, a real risk to delay actions. Uh, and uh, we may are working for, for, for that, uh, because we know that we have to prepare both a political statement and uh, a very concrete uh, set of policies. So that the recovery from COVID-19 it's our chance to create a green and just future we want. But I mean, these are political statements. Point is how to, to create a set of actions, very specific action on which uh, uh, to convince the people that we are helping them. And this is the one of the most beautiful things to work together because Sometimes when I try to explain to my fellow citizens why I'm creating new bike lanes or why I'm working on the uh, public transport, I tell them 
The first reason is that is because most of the most important cities in the world, Paris, Barcelona, or Melbourne, or what else, are going uh, in, in the same direction. So before you became mayor, you ran the, the, the expo, as you said, which had a very strong green strand to it. Uh, it was a pretty marvelous event, <laughs> which millions of people went to. Can you give us a flavor now, as you look at directing investment to decarbonization, which bits are easier and which bits are harder? So looking at transport or buildings, is that e or energy systems, is that easier? And then changing public behavior is that still the harder bit? Maybe persuading people from cars to bicycles or public transport, eating less meat. You are in one of the great gastronomic centers of the of the universe. You know how, how easy are these things to change? Now, uh, through the message of the fifteen minutes city, and we are working as uh, similarly to Paris or Barcelona, we are telling the citizen uh, to avoid. Uh, uh, part of the mobility and, uh, and, and, and the utilization of private cars, my action is to give you the possibility to have close to our house, our, our home, the right services you need. Schools, sport, green, health, and so on. Specifically, we are working, first of all, uh, on to improve the public transport system, prolonging uh, the lines uh, and going uh, uh, close to the peripheries or even uh, some uh, municipality close to Milan. Then uh, we are working to um, help the, let me say, the light mobility, creating 100 kilometers of new cycling uh, lanes and also promoting uh, all the shared means uh, of transportation uh, from bikes uh, to scooters, uh, to cars and to motorbikes. Then we created uh, a low emission zone, uh, which is covering more or less 70% of the city. Uh, and uh, in this part of the city, it is impossible uh, to enter into the zone if you are using a very polluting uh, car. And, and again, uh, related to food, for instance, uh, we are investing to turn uh, the food system in our school canteens, uh, because we produce more or less uh, 80,000 meals per day, as much as possible into plant-based food, yeah. which is good uh, for our health, and also for the health of the of the planet. Well, look, fantastic. Good luck with the next stages of this this very important work, and hopefully through the C40 as well, ensuring cities all over the world maintain their their leadership on climate change. We are all depending on it. Thank you very much. We are Thank you for your time. We are waiting for you in Milan. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we're going to shine a spotlight on another data-driven city, one of the City Lab hosts this year, which is uh, Bogota in Colombia. City Lab, bienvenidos a Bogota. Bogota is the driving force for change progress and inclusion in Colombia. In fact, I am the first woman lesbian mayor in our city. With or without the pandemic, we need to base our leadership in science, in knowledge, in empathy, and in solidarity, in collective action. We are the only city in Colombia and in Latin America that has all the open source data for the pandemic. All the databases are public so that any scientific person can verify the information we are providing to the people. Bogotá tiene 4,000 rastreadores, 4,000 personas, llamando a cada persona que va positiva. Roughly we have 700,000 kids in the public system school and almost 300,000 of them didn't have 
adequate equipment. So we propose our city council to invest in 100,000 tablets and computers for our kids. We have tried to do things by Colombian terms are a social revolution. We are the first administration and government that are able to support a basic income to 800,000 families, poor families in our city. Bogota is a city that never ever survived, that adapt, change, use technology, and most of all, use citizen empowerment, collective change to build progress. The highest the challenge, the highest the hope. Even though we have poverty, even though we have inequality, we can sacrifice material goals, but we are not willing to sacrifice lives. And we were able to honor that conviction. So it makes me so proud of my city and of my citizens. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to the City Lab. Um, I, I hope that you will stay with us for the next 15 minutes or so for this Urban Futures session. Um, today, this session will feature some really big thinkers who will be providing some predictions for the future of our urban world post COVID-19. I'd like to introduce our esteemed guests. We have Sir David Ajay, who is the um, principal of Ajay Associates in Accra, London and New York. Uh, we also will have Carlo Ratti, who's the founder of Carlo Ratti Associati and also the, the director of the Sensible Cities Lab in MIT. And finally, we will have Ruben Abraham, who is the CDO, CEO of the IDFC Foundation and IDFC Institute in Mumbai in India. The pandemic has exacerbated everything from economic to digital inequality. And what I'd like to hear from all of our panelists is, what do you think this will mean for urban life? Is there a bright side? And what do you think is the one big trend that you predict will shape urban life in the future? So maybe if I start with Ruben in that regard, perhaps you can tell us from your perspective, uh, particularly drawn on the example of Indian cities. I just want to establish uh, from the get-go that a lot of the possibilities that are being discussed in the West, for instance, remote learning or remote working and so on, are just not feasible in the developing world. So the number of people, say, in India who can actually do remote work, I, I would be surprised if that number is more than 2% of the population. Right. So for the vast majority of the population, we need to find a way for them to get back to work we need to find a way for children to get back to schools because currently children are trying to do remote learning on a 2G connection by and large. You know, my, my child is the lucky one who can who has a broadband connection at home and so on and so forth. So I think some of these um, things that very often get discussed in the West actually have no salience in the developing world. So seen from my perspective, I really am looking forward to getting back to normal so that the vast majority of my countrymen can actually get back to a life, start earning incomes again, and children don't see their lives destroyed. Thank you, Ruben. So David, you have operations from Accra to London to New York. What do you think? I think that Ruben has made a very important distinction, which I think is gonna underlie all our conversations. But I think that what is clear is that in terms of policy and planning, and in terms of the way in which we produce buildings, we have now realized that some of the, the, the sort of existence minimums that we've been setting for housing, for offices, all these things are now going to have to shift. We realize that we're gonna to have to create a much better relationship to the biophilic world, to the natural world, to have breakout spaces, to have flexible spaces. And I think in housing, we're gonna to have to start thinking about, you know, the, you know, the, the, the luxury of the, um, the extra room, which was, you know, uh, the library or something else in a, in a kind of a, in an affluent home is now suddenly becoming a very functional thing that it might be that we need to start thinking about sort of the box room that becomes a little library or a little office if there's an emergency. And that beca is becoming something that a lot of people are talking about as adding to the kind of way in which we make existence minimums for people. But also this idea that, you know, you can make housing without balconies and outdoor space is completely off the table now. Carlo, do you share the optimistic perspective? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say thanks, Alice. I would say I, I, I totally share it. And I also share it for another reason. You know, and um, well, first of all, last summer when I, when I traveled a little bit, I went to Europe, 
you know, I saw so much pent up demand for being together, for public space, for the space of the city. And the other reason I'm optimistic is that public space is one of the few antidotes we have to the extreme polarization we get when we only connect online. You know, when we only connect online, we tend to meet with people, with people who are very similar to us. Uh, you know, we can try to fend off diversity. We, you know, we avoid all everything that could actually challenge our comfort zone. Actually, public space, or even for that matter, the space of an office, is a space where we continuously need to negotiate a diversity and then other people, other ideas, other opinions, but that's a good thing. It's actually what, uh, what can help us, uh, first of all, again, you know, to, to, to not to segregate ourselves, but also it helps creativity. It's about different points of view coming together. And so I'm pretty sure that, you know, physical space uh, will have a surprising renaissance after the pandemic. You know, I think all of those kind of doom and gloom prophets who say this is the end of the city will be proven wrong. Let's hope so. David, I'd love to hear from you about how space has changed since the onset of the pandemic and the implications that you think that that will have for our offices and our homes in the future. There's been a huge heightened sense of what is the space of the home? You know, if you're lucky enough to be able to think about that and you have the, the ability to think about that, you know, I, it's amazing the amount of people that are now putting plants everywhere, that are doing home uh, urban farms, you know, little tomatoes uh, growing in the, on the window porch or seasoning and all the little things that, you know, we <laughs> were, were seen as luxuries and nobody had time to deal with are all suddenly part of the way in which we set up the architecture that makes the home feel much more like a place that we can stay in. I think that we've realized the deficit of our private spaces. And I think that offices now are also realizing that it's not just about big boxes with lights, you know, vast spaces, but you need much more breakout space. You need a differentiated experience. You need inside outside space. And I think this is all very, very healthy. And as Carla was saying, also we now prize where you have cities that have outdoor public space that's well-made. That has now become the treasure that people, you know, are now completely, you know, addicted to. You know, if you if you took for granted a park, well, now you realize that it's it's a very important part of the quality of life that you have in the city. So I think that you're going to hear a lot of demand for better quality public spaces in the developing world. I think that that's become very clear um, that, you know, there, there's just not, you know, the street is not enough as the public life of, of the city that you need to do much, much more. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it, hopefully this pandemic, as, as I was saying, I think it's going to really kickstart a sense of really valuing the quality of, um, of our spaces and our environment. David, something you're really well known in, I suppose one of your largest projects, is uh, designing the, the National uh, African American Museum in, in Washington, D.C. And of course, you know, that's a very different type of space. It's a social public space. What implications do you think will the pandemic have for those kinds of spaces in the future? No, I think that, um, you know, the National Museum of African American Indian Culture is, is really a, uh, the sort of new prototype of what a museum is in the 21st century. It's no longer just about being a sort of encyclopedia of objects that you sort of meander through. It's not about rooms, it's about experiences. So what the museum has sort of successfully done is to turn stories into experiences, spatial experiences and journeys. And I think that what has, even during this pandemic, what's made it you know, very successful is that you're able to take very specific tours they're like curated tours that um that take you through it they're digitally very enhanced and, and 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 capable of supporting the narrative and really enhancing the experience and so you're able to also move people directionally much much better because you're not you haven't got a sort of as it were rambling palace but you've got these kind of curated paths and i think that you're going to see a lot more of that only because also we live in a world where the narrative is actually as as important as the artifact in a sense that people's stories and the lives of people are also profoundly important, and it's not always about the artifact of, of the time. Um, those, those are also important. And so finding ways in which narrative can become part of the experience of teaching and edifying society is, I think, going to become a very important addition to the arsenal of the quality of cultural life that we have. Not only can we go and see beautiful things about our past and our history, but we're also going to want to know about the lessons learned, movements that have happened, 
what do we learn from these things? How do they teach us about, about being better citizens and how we will be in the world? And I, I think that the cultural sector is going to have to take on much more of this edifying role, which they did in the 17th, 18th and 19th century. In the 20th century, you know, we became a little bit more kind of um, hung up on the value of objects and the exclusivity. And I think that we're going to move into a world where we want to really, again, teach and learn lessons and, and understand how to make better citizens in the world. And the cultural sector is very much part of that. Thank you for that, David. Carlo, you've been doing some very recent uh, research in, in MIT, looking at the impl implications of us working online um, in, in terms of uh, how, how we communicate and, and the impact that that will have economically, socially, and indeed from an innovation perspective. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about those findings? And indeed, if you think uh, th there's any sort of long-term trends that we should be drawing from that research? Um, you, you know, this is something that adds to the body of evidence and to what we were saying before, that we need to go back to the physical space. And so let me tell you, just before the pandemic started, we were actually at MIT collecting data about uh, how people communicate, you know, anonymized information about all of the emails at the communication network. And then you know what, you got almost the perfect sociological experiment. What is the difference of a condition when people meet both digitally and physically versus a condition where people can only do Zoom calls from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or 24 seven, so all, all day long. And then well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten some of the, the, the findings, but basically what we are seeing is that because of that, our social networks are becoming weaker. Because of that, we are losing what sociologists call weak ties. Weak ties are very important. Weak ties are not the friends of our friends in our, our closely knit community of people we, we know very well. Weak ties usually are bridges to another group of people. And weak ties are, uh, a sociologist found uh, many years ago, there's a seminal work by Mark Granovetter in 1973 that looked at that. The paper is actually called The Strength of Weak Ties. So weak ties are very important for our social networks and well what we're seeing is that because of the pandemic weak ties seem to become even weaker so somehow that's another reason why we think that we need to go back to physical space because that's really where we can nurture our our networks that's a place where we bump into somebody we're not expecting to meet it's not somebody we we schedule a zoom call with but then you know we bump into her or him at a, at a cafe in the office somewhere else and then we have a coffee and there you might discover new ideas sometimes, you know, random ideas that are far from our universe and might change our future life. So again, one reason more to really value and nurture and go back to physical space. So I guess you're saying those informal connections that we, we have at the water cooler or the coffee machine allow us to break down our silos. So, so do you believe that we will go back to work life as normal because we need to break down those silos to innovate or will we adopt to a more hybrid model? No, I think, you know, as we were saying before, we needed to, to think about this kind of new existence minimum. At the same time, it's certainly not going to back to life as before. I think we're seeing a lot of people, you know, who are saying that, I mean, we all enjoy the flexibility that comes with the remote working. We can spend that extra day uh, in the countryside, we can, uh, or, you know, working from home, we don't need to commute during rush hours. Uh, we can actually commute a bit later. So, I mean, that's good for us and it's good for the city. We're also using the city in a better way. So I think, you know, some people talk about two plus three, two days of home working, three days of uh, home working in the office, other people, you know, 50-50 or whatever the balance would be. I think that, you know, we'll keep some of that. And then it's very, very important that this, this the time we spend in the office, then has more impact on our social networks. So again, it goes back to David's point and uh, you know, how we can design our offices in a different way so they become social condenser. They can you know, help us accelerate those processes. Very interesting. Um, Ruben, just to return to where we started, we started off hearing the perspective of Indian cities. And I think one of the remarkable things you were saying uh, was the situation is so incredibly different in, in India, for example, to maybe a city in the United States. Um, and, and also in that context, I just want to quote you. Uh, you said that the pandemic could be a turning point in India's urban journey if we draw the right lessons. What are the right lessons for Indian cities? So, so I think it's not just an Indian city problem. So I think, so this is a big distinction we need to draw, which is between crowding and density. Um, and the pandemic has, the, the infection rates go up dramatically if you get crowding. And this has been true whether you're looking at New York 
or you look at Singapore, or you look at Mumbai, it's the same story. So how do you basically reduce crowding? And the answer to that actually lies in land management. It li lies in removing supply side constraints to affordable housing, for instance. Uh, it, it lies in thinking through zoning restrictions, FSI restrictions, and so on and so forth. So that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is social protection. By and large, in, in, in a country like India, has always had a rural bias. Because the assumption was that if you live in a city, you are part of social networks and you have social capital, except what happens when you're a new migrant, you've lost your job and your benefits are tied to where you've come from. What you see is what you saw in India, which is millions of migrants start to walk home. So I think that really showed that the emperor had no clothes in that sense. So you really need to start thinking about social protection in urban areas. And then one sort of last thing, because we're running out of time, is, is there a way for us to embed the good behaviors that we have learned during COVID? So just to give you some quick data points here, uh, one of the things we discovered uh, in, in a city like Mumbai is that gastroenteritic diseases, so things like cholera, typhoid, etc., has dipped like crazy in 2020 because hygiene practices that were put into place to deal with COVID has had this positive effect on gastroenteritic diseases. Similarly, mask wearing has a weird effect on tuberculosis. And just to give you perspective on tuberculosis, TB kills 1400 people a day in India. That's about half a million people die of tuberculosis. So if there was a way to embed mask wearing as a behavior, anytime you're in a crowded space, that could have an effect on say tuberculosis. And, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a bunch of behaviors here that if we do the right thing, I think we could actually see a very positive kind of uh, uh, turnaround in the fate of uh, cities across the developing world. And just to summarize, if we are to see lasting changes for cities in uh, the global south, what exactly do, would you advise uh, city governments to focus on? So, I mean, I think right now, it's, it's all the things that I mentioned. And the other thing, hopefully coming from COVID, is to very seriously now think in terms of risk management. Uh, and risk management, not just in terms of pandemics, but risk management in terms of climate change and so on and so forth. See, when you talk about risk management, you quickly realize that a lot of it is actually related to organizational design. So how do you embed the thinking around risk management into organizations, into government, into the corporate sector, and so on? Again, COVID provides you the opportunity because if you said the same thing you know, two years ago, nobody would have listened to you. But today, they're likely to listen to you. And that then has an effect for the disasters that have come from climate change, for instance, and so on and so forth. So again, I tend to take a very kind of positive view on this. Yes, it's been a disaster for all of us. But if we do the right thing now, I think net net, we end up with a positive outcome. Completely agree. I think COVID-19 has managed to shine a light on many of the inequalities that already existed in our cities for a long time. And there's a real opportunity to address them in terms of delivering a just recovery. So thank you very much to David and to Ruben and to Carlo. Thank you, everyone. When art shows up in public spaces, people are drawn to it. Paint the Void Project is a unique initiative because it was born out of a place of unknown and unrest, hearing how quickly things were boarding up in the city. Here are all these blank canvases. Let's do something to help people feel uplifted and help artists have work during a time where they were told to stay home. We are approaching our 130th mural. In 2021, we were given enough to fund about 30 more artists and murals. This city is a home for artists. Right now, public art is reminding people of that.
That was great and fascinating to see how San Francisco is using public art to breathe new life into public spaces. You're all big fans too, I know, judging from your reactions in the chat. Uh, coming up, Mike Bloomberg is going to return to introduce a very special guest. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss that. Uh, but now, in our next several segments, we want to shine the City Lab spotlight on racial justice. How can cities build more just and equitable societies? What are the root causes of economic exclusion and inequality? And how can cities help close the racial wealth gap? We're going to start this urgent discussion with a panel led by somebody who's worked closely with Detroit, Milwaukee, Memphis, and Pittsburgh, just to name a few. Let's go now to Harvard's Tony Griffin, who's going to speak with Jackson, Mississippi Mayor Chukwe Lumumba and the best-selling author and the founding director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. I'm delighted to be in the company of Dr. Kennedy and Mayor Lumumba uh, today to talk about the Just City. Um, I thought we start our discussion with a little storytelling, um, reflecting upon the city, how we move through it as men, women, as we did as a child, as black folks, and um, how those multiple identities um, have shaped our experience of the city and the work we do today. So for example, I'm a kid from the South side of Chicago. Um, my entire community was black where we shopped, uh, where we went to get food, where we played. My teachers were black from the uh, fourth grade. Um, my only sort of experience with seeing folks different from me was when I went downtown and saw, you know, the shining skyscrapers, which then influenced uh, my uh, desire to be an architect. Uh, coming back to Chicago after going to the University of Notre Dame, uh, in that same sort of segregated space, I started to think about why was the city uh, so segregated and why were certain parts of the city being invested in uh, differently. So that's a little bit of my story about how I experienced the city uh, and how I've come to do this work around the Just City. Mayor Lumumba and Dr. Kendi, can you share with us your experience? My father had come to uh, Jackson, Mississippi in the early 70s to do uh, civil rights work. And so after uh, going back to Detroit, gaining a family and some other things, uh, my parents made the decision that they wanted to return to the South and they felt that uh, there was unfinished work in Mississippi. And so we came here, uh, you know, and my parents, you know, they offered their most precious resource, their family. And so much of my experience through uh, Jackson has been through the organizing of my parents that led me to be a part of different organizing efforts. Then ultimately what we began to understand was get a, a greater uh, discernment of the challenges that our people face and the, the cycles of humiliation that our people go through. And so uh, whether it was through the work of our of the Malcolm X grassroots movement and our community center or the the uh, more macro efforts that we've tried to implement uh, through running for elected office, uh, I've really gotten a sense of, of the challenges and, and the, the diversity of stories that our, our community face. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Kennedy? What's your story that brings you to this work? Well, I think for me, I, I grew up in, in Jamaica, Queens, New York, in pretty much all black neighborhood. And I, I think in many ways, I was raised in black spaces, raised by African American culture, and sort of come to understand it and, and love it. Um, and I think that understanding and love has caused me to to really seek basically for me to really be uh, aggrieved and angered and enraged when when i see uh, people who have come to love and who raised me uh, hitting the hitting the brick wall of of, of racism and, and and white supremacy or people degrading what i've always known to be human and and so i think you know coming up in that space and being nurtured to love Black people, uh, to understand Black people, to even understand those who think that Black people are the problem as opposed to racism has, has caused me to really focus on, on the real problem, which has always been racism. Yes. And each of us in our work as uh, academics, researchers, practitioners, designers, activists, public officials, um, have confronted the legacy of racism through the public policy 
uh, that we work on or that we come to understand uh, as the foundational sort of challenge of getting to the just city. So I'd like for each of you all to reflect upon um, where should we start? What policy, policy frameworks are most important for us to tackle at this moment? You know, I think that, that our focus must be, you know, how do we build an economy which is for and by the people as opposed to an economy which is by a few people for themselves? Uh, you know, what we have realized is as we look at the success of economies across uh, the country or, or look at the country itself as a successful or a failing economy, uh, one thing that, that economists fail to do is study people. Uh, they fa fail to look at sustainable development goals, uh, whether or not the, the, what is the quality of our education, what is the quality of the infrastructure people depend on, whether they have safe drinking water, uh, whether they have, you know, the, the ability to have safe streets and uh, whether there is, uh, what is, what is the wealth gap, the income gap uh, within communities. And those are the sustainable development goals that we have to look at. Uh, we have to be able uh, to remove, as I mentioned earlier, people from these cycles of humiliation where you see perfor poor performing schools, high crime, high poverty, uh, to an economy which reflects the inherent dignity of every single person. So you're, you're, you're raising a really important point, which is um, to me, and I, I feel like I take this on in, in my work and looking at transformative urban planning in cities like Detroit, and that the solutions we need to look to are really interconnected. Um, and we can no longer sort of work on policy by policy in silos. And that the ability for black households to gain wealth um, is to take on issues of housing, land ownership, education, health, environmental justice simultaneously. Um, paired with that, uh, Dr. Kennedy, your recent book, uh, 400 Souls, is this wonderful sort of collection of the history of this country, as you say, told by a community of folks. And what's been interesting for me in going through that book, um, which is um, narrated as a chronology, um, but allows the authors to create uh, interpretations and editorialize and contextualize these histories and policies, um, knowing our history is so important to moving and dismantling issues of racism in the city. How have you imagined uh, this type of uh, book and these uh, narratives might be used by policymakers to develop more effective anti-racist policies in cities? Well, I think one of the guiding sort of principles of, of 400, 400 Souls is pushing back against this idea of Black people as a monolith. And so we brought in 90 writers who have 90 different perspectives and, and 90 different backgrounds. And similarly, all cities are not a monolith. All majority Black cities uh, are not a monolith. And, and so the types of policy reforms or transformative changes that are needed in every city are going to be different. And, and I think that, that, that what that necessitates thereby is indeed listening to those people, listening to those activists, listening to those to those policymakers in each in each city, so we don't create one size fits all, uh, you know, an anti racist change. That it's really rooted in the people and the culture and the history and the politics and the conditions, you know, of every single place. Um, that is really important. Um, some of the work that I do at the Just City Lab at Harvard's Graduate School of Design um, is to put forward frameworks for cities to really. Um, assess uh, their own conditions of injustice, which I fully agree are quite unique from place to place, but their aspirations and the values that they need to um, put in place to achieve greater justice, I also think it's different. A just Jackson is very different than a just Gary or a just Miami or a just Rotterdam or a just New York. And so some of that has to do with um, who sits at the table of creating power. Uh, creating a just city. Um, what is the power uh, dynamic? What are the power imbalances that exist that perhaps have limited the ability to put forward more effective policy as it relates to dismantling uh, injustice and creating a more just city? So, Dr. Ibram, coming back to you and this work that you're about to do at the Anti-Racist um, Research Center at Boston University, is there a way for local policymakers or national policymakers to um, utilize and work with your center 
in order to help them inform the ways they can create more nuanced approaches to injustice in their city. So yes, that's why we sort of organized ourselves um, because, you know, as you know, um, there are so many incredible researchers and scholars on college campuses ar around the country and certainly in the New England area, which potentially has the largest sort of uh, density of scholars studying racism. But many of these scholars are only talking to other scholars. Many of these scholars are not transforming their research into potential policy proposals that can be adopted, or many of these scholars are not using their research expertise uh, in a way that local policymakers, mayors, uh, grassroots organizations could use. In other words, for instance, if, if, a, if a local uh, grassroots organization or a local policymaker recognizes that there's a serious problem of economic injustice, uh, it would be useful to them if they could so certainly bring in researchers who could study that uh, injustice and, and, and work with those people to create sort of community-informed and data-driven sort of policy proposals that can eliminate it, as opposed to them having to use an old study or an irrelevant study you know, in order to, to, to essentially uh, describe the problem. Mayor um, Lumumba, uh, you're a civic leader, an elected official, but you've also been and probably ma maintain yourself as a community activist. So you are in a position to um, create a more distributed model uh, of leadership and shared power. Um, how are you beginning to model that in your administration? Our goal is to uh, democratize power and, and the 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 principle in which guides my leadership in our administration is one of self-determination, uh, really trying to bring people into the fold uh, and understand the role that they have to play uh, in changing their condition. I think it's important that we understand that, that cities and community and what people experience out, out of cities and communities isn't by happenstance. You know, when we uh, were in the Just City Lab, we, we talked about how uh, planning and development is intentional for intentional outcomes in and, and uh, circumstances within communities. And so we see that there are policies uh, that have been created uh, that were intended to push people to the periphery, to not allow them access uh, and, and not to allow them uh, to, to have access to that power. You know, I talk often from the frame of, of a son of two activists and I have a propensity to talk to some of the larger things in life. Uh, but when I'm talking about self-determination and human rights and I'm knocking on doors when I'm campaigning, invariably, I'm confronted with a brother or sister who says, yeah, that's good, young brother, but how are you going to fix that pothole in the middle of my street? And so we need to be able to take these very basic, real challenges that people deal with each and every day and use them as a bridge uh, to some of the larger uh, structural inequities that we face in a community, literally connecting pothole to pothole and community to community. So people in Jackson, Mississippi understand why there's a community uh, that looks just like theirs in Jamaica, Queens. There's a community that looks just like theirs in Gary, Indiana or Detroit, Michigan. And, and in the process of fixing that pothole, what we ultimately teach them is that the pothole was never your problem in the first place. Your problem is that you don't control the decision making process that leads to a pothole being fixed. Your problem is that you don't control the curriculum that educates your children. Your problem is that you don't have as much say so over the economic development that takes place in your community. So your problem is a fundamental one you lack the self-determination to dictate the quality of life that you so justly deserve. Yeah. Um, thank you both. I, I'd just like to end this conversation by each of you maybe offering us uh, some insights on what you're most hopeful about uh, on this journey towards a just city. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, grateful that we're beginning to you know, have a laser focus on uh, understanding of uh, the dynamics that lead to communities uh, not enjoying the quality of life that they, they deserve. And so it's important uh, that we concretize this moment, uh, that we organize in a way that allows us to build policy, which better reflects the, the outcomes we want to see for our people. And, and I'm, I'm most hopeful that we're living in a time in which there, there are people and there are organizations and there are leaders like Maya Lumumba who are, who are razor focused on on ensuring that what's best for the people uh, and what's best for humanity uh, is is putting forth in policy and in policy changes. And and you know 
I mean, people excite me, you know, what people are doing and the courageous efforts uh, that, that people are undertaking right now in this moment, you know, is, is what gives me hope. Thank you both for being in conversation with me today. Um, have a wonderful day and continue your great work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Continue this important conversation. I'll now turn it over to longtime chief executive, a mission-driven venture capitalist, and a member of the board of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Here is Ken Chenault. City Lab has always been about why our cities are so special, but it's also about what we need to do to make them even better. And the racial wealth gap has long been one of the challenges holding us back. It's one reason so many neighborhoods are still segregated, so many schools are still under-resourced, and so many dreams are still unrealized. And it's devastating for the economies of our cities. Thankfully, Bloomberg Philanthropies has looked at the data, and it's clear. If we invest in building Black intergenerational wealth today, we can make a big difference in the years to come. Our next speaker, Ann Price, the president of the Insight Center for Community Economic Development, will talk about what steps we need to take to get there. Ann, take it away. Inequality is a defining American issue, and perhaps no measure exemplifies injustices and failures in our economic decisions than what we call the racial wealth gap. Today, the typical white family owns $164,000 more in wealth than a typical black family. And the ratio of black to white wealth is as high today as it's been since the beginning of the century. In order for us to begin to tackle this deep-rooted inequity, we must challenge conventional claims made about race and wealth. Claims that are predicated on the notion that if Black people just work harder and study harder that they can amass the same amount of wealth as white people. Instead, we must begin to focus on root causes and the structural characteristics of our economy. And we also must reckon with four foundational truths that are driving this inequity in the first place. The first truth is that the rise of corporate power in conjunction with the misuse of government power have systemically denied Black people's ability to build wealth. Throughout history, white Americans have been given wealth starter kits in the form of land, government-backed mortgages, farm loans, business subsidies, and a social safety net, oftentimes exclusively. Black Americans were intentionally left out. A great example of this is the GI Bill, in which white veterans received in today's terms over $190 billion in loans for homes and businesses and farms. However, 1.2 million Black veterans were completely shut out of this opportunity. Decisions made in corporate boardrooms may seem like a distant factor in thinking about racial wealth inequality, but corporate equity holdings are a large driver of wealth concentration. And corporate ownership is completely unequal. As of the third quarter in 2019, 92% of corporate equity and mutual fund value was owned by white people. And black households only owned about 1.5%. If wealth is built through government policies and enables Americans to pass on wealth and advantage from one generation to the next, then it stands to reason that strategies focus on individual behavior and actions will be insufficient to solve a systemic and structural problem, which is the second truth. For example, conventional wisdom proclaims that education is a great equalizer. Nothing can be further from the truth when it comes to wealth. Black households whose had graduated from college have less wealth than white households whose had dropped out of high school in fact, the difference in wealth widens as educational levels increase. Income plays a role in the ability to generate wealth, but income alone does not translate into wealth for black families as it does for white Americans. 
The third truth is that increasing income for Black people is necessary, but it will be insufficient to address racial wealth inequality. In other words, equalized income does not equalize wealth. For example, middle income whites have about $158,000 more than middle income Blacks. And as income increases, wealth differences also widen. The fourth and final truth is that narratives about Black people play a significant role in racial wealth inequality. Many historical policies not only excluded Black people, but were rooted in racist stereotypes about them as being lazy, unintelligent, and morally degenerate. These longstanding tropes about Black people's worth provide a rationale for disinvesting in Black communities and also for accelerating punitive policies. So we know how to build wealth in America, but we must chart a new compass, one that changes the rules, practices, and norms that are at the root of racial wealth inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that great presentation and for all the critical work you do at the Insight Center. We really do have a great program this year, and we're actually going to make a little history today. This is the first time that a Vice President of the United States has ever addressed City Lab, and that's only fitting because she's been making a lot of history lately. Vice President Kamala Harris has served in every level of government, federal, state, and local. We know there are just a few things going on in Washington, so we're very grateful that she was able to join us today and that she made City Lab one of her earliest stops to discuss the Biden team's vision and agenda. I know all of us look forward to hearing her perspective on how cities and the federal government can collaborate to achieve their goals. And it's my honor to introduce her, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Mayors, leaders, innovators, it is an honor to address City Lab 2021. And thank you to Mayor Mike Bloomberg for asking me to be with you today. You have taken on some of our world's greatest challenges, whether that's climate change or global health. So thank you, Mike. And thank you all for your leadership. Around the world, cities big and small are the heartbeat of our countries. Throughout history, cities have driven great change. Home to more than half the world, cities bring people together to exchange goods and ideas, to promote entrepreneurship, and to power our economies. I was a city leader in San Francisco, and I know what's needed in our cities. I know what's possible also. I know what you make possible. Your job is to solve problems as creatively as you can, and the job of leaders like President Biden and myself is to help scale the best of those solutions. Take infrastructure, from high-speed rail to high-speed internet. Right now, we have the opportunity, dare I say the imperative, to strengthen infrastructure in our cities and create good union jobs. Think of small businesses. Cities are incubators for startups and hubs for mom and pop shops. These businesses create jobs and foster community. And we need to make sure they have access to the capital they need to get through this time. Which brings me to COVID-19. With so many people living so close together, cities have been particularly hard hit. City leaders around the world have responded with innovation outdoor clinics so residents can safely get the care they need, redesigned public spaces so families can be distanced while outside, Wi-Fi hotspots so students learning virtually get online. We need this ground up, human-centered, evidence-based ingenuity to beat this virus and build back our economies. And that's why the President and I are pushing the United States Congress to finish passing our American Rescue Plan so cities have the resources they need to innovate and replicate the best ideas.
This plan includes critical support for those communities that have been hardest hit, keeping small businesses open and first responders on the job. Over the past months, I've spoken with mayors from across the country about this plan. And without exception, they have said, our cities need this plan to survive. So I'm going to be clear. Survival is not the end game. We want our cities and our countries to thrive, not just survive. The crises we face have made clear the inequity and injustice that persists. The opportunity in front of us is to shape a better future, a future where every neighborhood has clean air and clean water, where workers are treated with dignity, where businesses can grow, where every child can reach their potential, where every family has equal opportunity. And we can build that future by solving problems. We can build that future through innovation. We can build that future together. So thank you all, and I look forward to partnering with you in the days, weeks, and months and years ahead. Take care. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. This has truly been a history-making day here at City Lab, and this global summit is just getting started. We'll see you back here tomorrow, starting again at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Please join us to hear from more special guests and to journey once again to our dynamic host cities all around the world. For now, this is Errol Lewis in New York City signing off. Thanks very much, and we'll see you again tomorrow here at City Lab.